Good morning in Washington, good afternoon in London, and good evening in Tokyo. Uh, my name is Julia Friedlander, I'm the Steve Boyden Gray Senior Fellow, and I direct our work here at the Atlanta Council on Economic Statecraft. And today we're here to discuss investment screening and in the context of the broader economic statecraft environment. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome three distinguished panelists and government experts to discuss this with us. Today, we're also host co-hosting with Karen, um, and my co-host Kit Conklin is also going to be presenting some case studies uh, and uh, to outline exactly how, uh, how investment screening is important in the nitty gritty. So today, we're welcoming Peter Harrell, the Senior Director for International Economics and Competitiveness at the U.S. National Security Council. Welcome back. Kaseki Jun, the Director General Trade for Trade and Control Department and Economic Security Policy at the Ministry of Economic Economy, Trade and Industry, that's METI in Japan. And Hugh Walters, the Director of Investment and Economic Security at the Ministry of Defense in the United Kingdom. What we're going to do today is first offer each of our panelists a few minutes to give some opening remarks. We'll then turn to Kit to present his case studies, and then we'll have some Q&A in which I encourage you all to raise your virtual hands and we'll bring you into the conversation. Without further ado, um, Peter, if you're there, I'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Great. No, thank you so much, Julia, for organizing this uh, event, and it's such a pleasure for me able to be able to be on um, with you. I'm going to make just very short uh, opening uh, remarks because I'm really quite interested to see some of the case studies and to uh, learn uh, from the audience and hear hear perspectives um, from the audience. But I'll make just a couple of um, a couple of minutes of very brief uh, opening remarks first on how we see. Um, inbound uh, investment in the U.S. Uh, and then on where we see some gaps uh, potentially in uh, our current review of uh, foreign investment uh, in the U.S. And the first thing I should say is that as a general matter, uh, the Biden-Harris administration strongly welcomes foreign investment uh, in the U.S. You know, we back over the summer as part of the Commerce Department's uh, Select USA Summit, a big annual summit that the Commerce Department organizes to attract foreign investment to the U.S., uh, put out for the first time in uh, four years uh, a U.S. declaration of an open investment policy uh, signed uh, in the name of the president, making clear that you know at the highest levels of this administration, we welcome foreign investment in the U.S., uh, and understand the benefits uh, foreign investors uh, in the U.S. have in creating jobs, uh, wage growth, and economic opportunity um, here uh, in the in the United States. And so, I just want to start by making that uh, point uh, right at the top of as general matter, we we, we strongly support um, foreign investment uh, in the in the United States and see a lot of opportunity to work with our allies uh, on investments across a whole range of sectors. Um, we do, however, recognize that a you know, select uh, subset of foreign investment in the United States poses potential national security risks, particularly uh, with respect to key uh, emerging and foundational technologies and also with respect to, you know, investments that might be close in real estate and other things that might be close to uh, safely implement CFIUS as updated uh, in 2018 under the Foreign um, uh, Investment Risk Review Modernization Act. And I think you've seen this administration take a very um, uh, strong approach uh, as we've implemented uh, FIRMA uh, through the CFIUS process to ensure that we are mitigating uh, risks where we identify them uh, and to um, ensuring the transactions where risks are not mitigable do not get uh, completed. Um, and so I want to say on that, you know, Gisipius, uh is, as, as all many of you uh, in the room know, generally speaking, a private uh, and um, behind closed doors kind of kind of process. But we are, as you might imagine, I can't talk about specific cases, but we are, as you might imagine, you know, quite focused on investments from our strategic competitors uh, in as I say, key emerging and foundational uh, technologies and ensuring that if there are such investments, any national security risks around transfer of intellectual uh, property, around transfer for manufacturing capacity, you know, around uh, other areas of know-how, uh, you know, cannot be um, provided uh, upstream to a 
uh, company in a um, geopolitical uh, competitor or, or adversary. I think one area we've been particularly focused on as we think about Cipius and Firma is data protection and how do we ensure that where there is a foreign investor buying a U.S. company that has substantial access to U.S. Uh, person sensitive data, how do we ensure that data is protected, that data uh, does not uh, leave uh, the possession of the uh, U.S. subsidiary, and how do we make sure that the data, uh, you know, does not get um, uh, contributed to a foreign competitor or adversary? So, so the data set of issues has been particularly um, sensitive uh, to us. So, you know, I think we have um, been very focused on Firma uh, and implementing Firma. We've also been you know, quite focused on how we can use other tools to close gaps in um, uh, in our current investment screening review. And to give an example of what I mean, you know, CFIUS allows us to block a or, or mitigate a foreign uh, acquirer of a U.S. Uh, a U.S. company. It does not really give a tool to um, you know provide to, to or to to impair you know, other kinds of transactions between the potential foreign acquirer and the U.S. company and technology, we block the transaction uh, and the U.S. company then simply strikes a licensing deal to sell on a sort of commercial sale basis, the same technology uh, to the Chinese acquirer, we block the transaction. So we've actually done a process, started a number of years ago, but we've been working to strengthen to kind of better link our export controls and our uh, CFIUS process so that if we were going to block a transaction of that nature, we could also issue under export control authorities various directives that might prohibit the kind of commercial sale of the technology where we have uh, blocked the, um, the, 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 the acquisition. So we're trying to align our tools to get at the substance of the problem rather than just focusing on the, the form uh, of, the, um, uh, of the problem. Um, so that's one area where we've been working to kind of close gaps and strengthen uh, our tools. Another area that we've been working on uh, to close gaps and uh, strengthen tools is really to dig in on you know, a better understanding of what some of the, the the, the, the risks are around emerging technologies. And I, I, I've been candid, you know, and having sat on the CFIUS committee for 10 months now or nine months now, I think CFIUS as it currently exists is not very well structured to deal with investments in emerging technology. Some of that is slow rule writing over the Commerce Department, but even putting that aside, CFIUS really requires a case-by-case -case review with a specifically articulable national security risk posed by a transaction. And sometimes when there is an, a, an investment in a, you know, emerging technology, you know, it, it's hard to show how, you know, a $5 million investment in a startup uh, that, that, you know, is not yet playing, but might down the road play an important role in emerging technology. It can be hard to show how that particular transaction poses a national security risk in a kind of concrete and you know tactile uh, way. It's more amorphous. And I think we are looking at some ways to kind of you know think through how we could issue some guidance, how we could um, you know better address the, um, are not well suited where this risk feels more um, uh, amorphous. So that's another area that I think we are Kind of engaged in looking at how we can close uh, close that uh, that gap. Um, I realize I've actually gone on a few minutes longer than I thought I would uh, already, so I think I'll leave it there and get to other topics in Q and A. Sure, thank you. Um, but that was a fantastic overview, um, and also sort of leads me to to turn to Kazaki Jun in in Tokyo. I mean, so in his ministry, all of these issues uh, issues, export control, sanctions, and investment screening are all housed in the same shop. So uh, he has an overview of of all of it. So, sir, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Julia, for your kind introduction. I'm very much pleased to join this distinguished panel and to speak after Peter. Uh, my opening remark is composed of two uh, points. And the first point is about the supply chain resilience and the economic security policy uh, by a government as a whole and uh, with uh, all tools. And the second point is about Meti's uh, policy and role in the context of economic security 
in particular, today's topic, uh, investment screening and export control. And sometimes I, I uh, talk about the interfaces with uh, industries. Okay, the first uh, is the economic uh, security policy as growth strategy. And the basis of national security is uh, our rapid expanding into the economic and the technological fields due to technological innovation and uh, geopolitical changes. And the vulnerabilities in supply chains are becoming clear due to the uh, COVID-19 and the other disruptive supply chain challenges. So in this respect, the uh, Japanese government recently stated in the government-wide documents, such as growth strategy, decided by the cabinet the last June, that Japan will strengthen and promote economic security policy. So Japan intends to secure autonomy and gain superiority as well as to deepen cooperation with like-minded countries and uh, international order based on uh, fundamental values and rules. So Japan will strengthen its effort to know, protect and promote critical technology via a holistic form of uh, government approach. So now uh, here is to identify choke points uh, in the supply chains. Protect includes uh, export controls, such as a uh, new framework uh, uh, by like-minded countries uh, which possess uh, critical technologies and uh, strengthened uh, so-called deemed export control for intangible technology transfer. And the protection policy also includes uh, imp investment screenings, which uh, should be uh, uh, strengthened. And also it includes uh, outreach to academia and research institutions. We say the uh, uh, research integrity, which is where the uh, researchers uh, must disclose uh, uh, influence of the entities or foreign uh, governments. So that's a, a protection policy. And promote is to support uh, research and development uh, of uh, critical technologies, including aerospace, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, high performance computers, semiconductor advanced materials and biotech. So there are many uh, support measures. So among them, uh, four areas were identified in a growth strategy, uh, namely uh, uh, semiconductor, pharmaceutical products, batteries, and uh, critical minerals, or we say rare earth. So these are the, our uh, government policy uh, as a whole. And actually, uh, well, we have a new prime minister, uh, Kishida, and his first general policy speech at the parliament on the 8th October 2021 uh, referred to promotion of economic security policy and as a newly established minister responsible for economic security. So aiming at the construction of resilient supply chain and to move forward on our economic security uh, policy. Okay, so now let me uh, go to the specific of the METI's role and the METI's, you know, four aspects uh, from the context of economic security policy. The first is uh, the implementation of the export controls as well as the examination of the vast majority, let's say 90% of the covered business sectors in the investment screening. As uh, all dual use uh, listed items, and technologies by export control regimes and weapons are equally covered in the investment screening. Therefore, in my department, expertise of the technology assessment office in the same department, uh, including assessment of vulnerability, threat, and consequence uh, is effectively reflected in the quality of implementation of for both export control and the investment screening, of course, with due care of the uh, business uh, confidential information. So that is what we are benefiting from the uh, implementation of both export control and investment screening. And the second role as METI is, uh, of course, a promotion of critical uh, industries such as semiconductor and rare earth or critical mineral. And third, METI's role is uh, resilience of uh, basic infrastructure, such as electricity or gas, uh, to check the vulnerability of equipment, system, and outsourcing. And fourthly and finally, METI is, of course, uh, responsible for the interface uh, with industries and uh, uh, consultations with industries. So we are now uh, conducting uh, intensive consultations with in industries 
to uh, you know diffuse the idea of the economic security policy. And as Peter said, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, you know a new uh, like CFIUS, a uh, new foreign exchange and foreign trade act, uh, which was entered into force uh, uh, last, uh, uh, well, one year ago, one and a half year ago, uh, June uh, 2020. So we have one year and a half passed uh, since the uh, uh, free enforcement of a new foreign exchange and foreign trade act. Um, so which uh, lowered threshold of the prior notification of listed companies from 10% to 1%. But at the same time, we exempted uh, uh, certain uh, uh, in investment, uh, like a portfolio investment from, from prior uh, notifications uh, to take the balance between the growth and uh, investment screening. And also we can uh, we update uh, the uh, sectors or designated sectors. For example, as Peter said, the data is very important. Therefore, we added the data process services, software services, and components related to information technologies in 2019. So that is now, these are sectors are now subject to the investment screen as the data is so important. And also uh, we included the medical uh, device and pharmaceutical device in 2020. And uh, most recently, uh, critical minerals and the relevant research uh, related sectors was were well, added in uh, investment screening uh, just October 2021. So we are now updating uh, as appropriate uh, the investment screening to strengthen, uh, or as uh, Peter said, uh, fill the gap or close the gap uh, regarding the uh, sensitivity, vulnerability, and so on. So that is, uh, I, I think, a brief overview of uh, my part uh, as a you know, growth strategy, economic security policy as a whole, and the METI's role. So the rest of the issues I can uh, pick up uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Back to you, Julia. Thank you so much. That's been really, really helpful to give us an overview of, of Japan's regime and how quickly things are moving on your side. Um, over in the UK, things are moving quickly too. As I understand, this um, investment security mechanism is also relatively new. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Hugh Walters to give us an overview of how he sees it from the UK. Julia, thank you very much, and uh, hello to everyone who's on the, the webinar. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you today. I mean, from my perspective, this is very timely. Um, we're just completing the largest shakeup in UK's uh, approach to economic security in the last 20 years. So very much welcome the chance to highlight some of the things that we're doing, um, take questions or uh, take comments as well. And just as Peter was saying about the US, the UK, it's a very open economy and will remain so. So inward investment is extremely important to us. However, you know, we obviously have a need to have the right safeguards in place to protect our national security and the safety of our citizens. And the government's current legal powers on mergers and acquisitions really date back to 2002. And as we all know, the world has changed an awful lot since then. And we're modernizing our approach to reflect some of these changes. So really, you know, looking at what's driving these, there's both a sort of top-down and a bottom-up element to this, I think. Um, so the existing legislation that we have, it was drafted in an era when national security risks were primarily seen as relating to, to large companies that were explicitly operating in the defence and security sectors. So nowadays, what we see, and we've actively encouraged this as well, is much more innovation, much more disruption uh, being created by startups and happening at the SME level, and much greater crossover, I think, between civil and military technologies. And really, over the last four or five years, what we've been seeing is a range of transactions popping up involving companies and technologies of this sort with significant national security implications for us. So we've made some changes to our existing legislation to try and address some of the more urgent gaps. However, what we've really found is that our legislation and our processes are not really well suited to the sorts of dynamic threats, the evolving more complex risks that we're now starting to have to address. Um, and in addition to what we've really been seeing on the ground in terms of transactions, um, we've been seeing changes at the sort of geopolitical level and the landscape there has been changing very rapidly over the last few years. So the rules, something that we've tried to respond to in the UK's integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy, which was published earlier this year. 
um, and which recognised, I think, that the distinction between economic security and national security is now largely redundant. It highlighted the likelihood that we'll see more states um, adopting economic statecraft as a lever in systemic competition, including the very deliberate use of economic policy to target and undermine the economic security and security interests of their rivals. And in fact, it recognised that our adversaries and competitors are already acting in a much more integrated way. So fusing military and civilian technology, increasingly blurring the boundaries between war and peace, prosperity and security, trade and development, and domestic and foreign policy. So the changes that we're making to our foreign investment screening regime is one part of our overall response to these trends. Um, so our new National Security Investment Act come into force in January next year, although unusually its powers have a sort of retrospective effect. So they will apply to any transactions that took place after November 2020, when the legislation was first introduced in Parliament. And this is really to provide a deterrent and to stop people rushing through transactions in advance of the new legislation coming into effect. Um, so in addition to modernising our protections, you know, the legislation will provide a much more transparent and a faster process for investors as well, with defined timescales for scrutinising transactions. Um, for the first time for us, it introduces a mandatory notification regime across 17 sensitive sectors of the economy with significant new penalties, including criminal penalties for non-compliance. Um, and beyond this, the government has powers to call in transactions across the economy if these raise national security risks. So this new legislation is really part of a series of changes across government. It will be supported by the creation of a new central investment security unit, which will manage the casework. But the national security assessments will be to pull together the range of assets that we can contribute, including technical expertise, intelligence and analytical capabilities. Um, we see inter uh, international collaboration as a really critical part of this. So we know that state level competitors will seek to acquire technology or capabilities wherever they think the protections are weakest. They'll also look to acquire capabilities through multiple transactions across different nations that might individually sit below our threshold for intervention, but which cumulatively create a substantial national security risk. And that's very much why I think international conversations such as this one are so important. So uh, thanks to everyone for the engagement on this, and I very much look forward to continuing this, this conversation. So thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And I think what you just said is underscores again how sort of fluid a lot of the situation is and how governments are really working to, to respond to a very cha rapidly changing atmosphere structurally as well. And I think one, one, one point I would make here before we turn, turn to Kit is that, you know, Peter's sitting in the White House, Kazeki Jun is within the economics ministry in Japan, and you're at the MOD, right? And so it's really a whole of government approach. Um, and it's really a question of how governments talk to each other, right? And who's corresponding with whom? Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over to Kit now to give us uh, to walk, give us a flavor of what this looks like on the ground and, and the research that his firm does. Go ahead. Great. Thanks, Julia. It's a, a pleasure, as always, to be uh, back with the Atlantic Council discussing these critical issues. Um, a, a warm thank you as well to our panelists. Um, so really, when we think about foreign direct investment screening, we kind of get into the nitty gritty. We really think about these issues from a strategic perspective and then be able to kind of see exactly what this investment looks like. Um, so with that, we'll pull up the uh, networks and we'll get started. So I, as a Kentuckian, um, I'm keen to, to discuss this specific case study uh, because it revolves around my home state of Kentucky and a Chinese state-owned company called the CRC Group. Um, in terms of background, CRC ostensibly specializes in the development of railroads and related technologies. Um, however, our research has found that CRC uh, plays a very active role in China's military civil fusion system as well. Um, in this case, CRC controls a subsidiary company called Jujo uh, Times New Materials Technology. Um, and this company is a defense contractor that has multiple relationships um, with the Chinese uh, Navy as well as uh, various shipyards. Um, so interestingly, Jujo Times New Material also has a global presence both in Europe and the United States, but not necessarily with that name. 
which leads us to kind of why FDI screening gets complicated. Um, so in this case, you can see on the chart that Jujo wholly owns a company in Germany called CRC New Materials Technologies. Uh, the Chinese company bought uh, the German company a few years ago and have since changed its name for the European market. Um, however, when the Chinese bought the German company, they also acquired all of the German company's subsidiaries around the world. To include, uh, in this case, the Chinese government now wholly owns a company in Kentucky called Bose Rubber and Plastics. Uh, this company was indirectly acquired, uh, of course, by Chinese investments in Germany, which really strikes at the heart of, of how and why multilateral uh, screening is important for these issues. Um, and relatedly, I'd also note that um, the same Chinese company, CRC Group, acquired an Italian UAV manufacturer and defense contractor called Alpi Aviation as well. Um, and the Italian government reported that uh, the company that bought this, Mars HK, is a majority-owned Chinese state-owned enterprise. They paid over 90 times the asking price for the Italian company. Um, the Italian company was for sale. The Chinese paid 90 times that price in order to acquire the intellectual property and technology. The Italian government also stated that the goal for this acquisition was ultimately to uh, shut down the Italian plant and quote, relocate the company's production structure to mainland China, um, which kind of leads us back to the purpose of this discussion, right? FDI screening. Uh, this case study really illustrates the importance of a multilateral approach where you have um, a peer adversary uh, buying companies uh, that are responsible for defense technologies in Europe, um, acquiring U.S. subsidiaries through their acquisitions of, of European firms. And it's, it's a very complicated uh, way to think about these issues. But when it comes to FDI due diligence, when it comes to CFIUS due diligence and risk management, you really have to understand uh, the shell game that happens with, with some of these acquisitions. Um, and so kind of speaking of complicated ownership and foreign direct investment structure, let's turn to case study number two. Um, this, uh, you know, similar story here where uh, th this case study involves a series of ch uh, Chinese state-owned companies that successfully acquired a U.S. semiconductor manufacturer called Matson Technologies. Um, as some of you may know, parts of this acquisition have previously been reported on. Um, however, our goal here is to demonstrate the importance of FDI due diligence as it relates to complex ownership and control structures, as well as the associated supply chains. Because Ultimately, when you're uh, conducting FDI screening, when you're thinking about these risks from a national security perspective, it's critical to identify where in the ownership chain there's touch points back to foreign militaries, foreign intelligence services, foreign law enforcement agencies, where that foreign ownership control and influence risk exists. Um, so with that, let's get started on this particular case study. Um, so to demonstrate state control, we'll start by examining how, uh, in this case, the Chinese State-Owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission wholly owns an investment firm called Beijing E-Town International Investment Development Company. Um, this is a very common uh, structure for Chinese foreign direct investments, where the Chinese state will buy a, a company or own or control a company in Beijing or Shanghai or uh, Hong Kong, wherever the case may be is, uh, that doesn't have necessarily any explicit ties back to the, the, the central state. However, when you really dive in and uncover the networks, you're able to identify that, that foreign control and foreign ownership tied back into the central government. Um, so back kind of to this. So as we can kind of see on the right, Beijing E-Town partially owns a Chinese defense company that supplies technologies to the Chinese rocket force. Um, and I highlight this relationship because the U.S. military has described the PLA rocket force as, quote, the key element of Chinese military responsible for organizing, manning, training, and equipping China's nuclear and conventional missile forces. And so, you know, while this relationship is certainly interesting, Beijing E-Town's relationship back to the Chinese uh, nuclear forces, you know, really, we're here to discuss foreign direct investment. So, you know, if we scroll down and look at the second part of this network, we see that Beijing E-Town also owns an industry investment center, as well as a semiconductor investment center. Um, and through this very kind of complex ownership structure, we eventually see how the Chinese government uh, owned companies were able to acquire the U.S. semiconductor a company at the bottom of the chart called Matson. And so, you know, we wanted to show this example because it highlights just the sheer complexity of uh, foreign direct investment due diligence. There are always a maze of actors and the spider web of beneficial owners. And, you know, I'd also note that this is just a very small section of the overall network. Um, when it comes to um, Russian uh, tied uh, defense investments or Chinese uh, state run uh, investments, the, the networks are infinitely complex. Uh, there's dozens of entities that are involved in these, these types of activities. And 
uh, following the money flows and following that foreign ownership control and influence uh, risk is, is, is certainly something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so, you know, I won't go into too much here in the interest of time, but I'll just kind of stop there and conclude the case study sections with, you know, a quick, a quick thought. Um, really, from our perspective, when we think about foreign direct investment regulations in the United States and, and overseas, it's, it's critical um, to really think about these things from a multilateral perspective. Um, these case studies demonstrate how, in this case, the, the Chinese government, uh, Chinese controlled companies are buying firms in the United States through acquisitions and, and third party jurisdictions in the EU, um, Italy, Germany, in this case. And, you know, and if you're doing that due diligence from an industrial perspective, it's extremely difficult uh, to help uh, folks comply with CFIUS regulations. And, and certainly this will be a challenge in the UK context as well, the, the National Security and Investment Act of 2021 coming online soon. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll reserve any more comments and turn it back over to Julia. Uh, thanks again for, for hosting, us with, uh, hosting this event with us. Of course. Thank you, Kit. Um, that was fascinating. I'm just going to say, um, and just to see the complexity and also just the qual quality of your research. Um, well, let's, let's go into Q&A now. Um, and we'll start, we'll start a few, with a few questions on our end, Kit, we can go back and forth. Um, but please, um, I see some questions already in the Q&A function. Please come forward with uh, with all of your burning thoughts and feelings about investment screening and the like, and we'll try to try to work them in here. Um, you know, the, and, and so please, um, all three of you, feel free to respond to the case studies and give us your thoughts um, as well. But I think, you know, for to start out, my question would be, how much do you think the the private sector um, entities that you speak with understand um, understand these risks? And how do you communicate the necessity of compliance? I mean, we talked to, so, you know, it's, it, from the sort of private sector side, these things are hard to comply with, right? Um, so I, I'd, uh, I'd like to get a flavor of that, sort of that communication and that back and forth. I think of communication in advance of the new legislation coming in. Um, and I think there are significant differences by sector. So if you look at the defense sector or the, um, the security sector, they understand most of these risks pretty well. And certainly when you deal with upper tier companies, they're also used to dealing with quite a lot of government regulation in those businesses. Um, so, you know, compliance for them is a more natural thing. When you start to look, um, you know, outside that group, I think you find it's a bit more of a problem. So if you look at dual use uh, technology areas, so maybe some of the civil aerospace and all the rest of it, um, those companies are not as awake to some of these risks, I think, as we would like them to be. So there's quite a large education process going on alongside the introduction of the, the new legislation. Um, generally, though, one of the things that companies have welcomed is the fact that the, the changes that we're bringing in are going to lead to a more transparent and more predictable process. So the current legislation doesn't have very much in terms of timelines for, for some bits of it. Um, we now have some quite t um, tight deadlines for turning around um, decisions on this, which I think is something that the private sector and investors welcome. You want else? Um, because um, like you mentioned this when when you're opening um, in your opening comments. So if you have any anything further, call to add on it. Yeah, I'm in line with you. I mean, uh, in the case of Japan, uh, we have a long history uh, with a close consultation with industries and uh, private sector in the context of Expo and all. So there is a tradition to think about more on uh, dual use items and weapons of uh, uh, mass destruction. So uh, they check the, of course, uh, uh, level of technologies and also uh, end users. So that's a mixture of the assessment. So that is a history. And then uh, most recently, that is a strengthened uh, investment screening process. I think uh, they use both uh, uh, technique uh, to assess the uh, technologies at the same time uh, end users. And uh, as the case study said, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, structure of the end users are so complicated. So of course, uh, uh, part is, is, is a government job, but uh, the other part is uh, industries. They uh, need to at least uh, collect the information regarding the risk and also uh, they collect the uh, public information as well. So that is a sort of a core work. And sometimes uh, how can we uh, achieve the uh, right result? So that is uh, my experience uh, in this sense. Thanks, Julia. And 
I'll jump in for uh, you know a question for for Peter here. Um, you know, as you kind of think about the administration's policies for multilateral uh, engagement, where do you see FDI screening? Where's the nexus with supply chain integrity, um, export control policies, kind of merging together with allies around the world? Thanks for the. Um... Thanks for the question, uh, and I think it's it's one that we are are actively working on. I mean, I think you know, as your case study kit made clear, um, you have to think about investment screening in a multilateral approach because a lot of the ways in which you know companies here in the U.S. get uh, acquired today is indirectly. They're already owned by a foreign company, and then a new acquirer comes in and, and buys the foreign uh, parent, and uh, that changes the ultimate beneficial ownership of the U.S. Uh, company. So, um, I, you know, I think both for sort of understanding and controlling what's going on here at home, we have to uh, work with our allies and partners. And also, you know, because at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the policy goal here of having investment screening in the U.S., it's really about trying to deny a competitor uh, or adversary access to some technology or expertise or know-how. Uh, and obviously that know-how may be available, uh, technology may be available um, outside the United States. And so, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we're simply blocking the investment in some U.S. firm and then, you know, the Chinese or Russian or whatever buyer goes out and acquires exactly the same technology in a, in a, in, you know, in a U.S. Uh, US ally. So you have to work on this multilaterally. And I would say, you know, we've generally been structuring our dialogues on investment screening uh, on a bilateral basis. We've generally done it, you know, with a, um, a bilaterally with kind of key uh, allies and partners, um, as well as with kind of emerging allies and partners. Um, we have done some on a little bit uh, more of a multilateral basis. You know, we've had some discussions in the Quad, for example, in Asia. Uh, having some discussions with the um, European Union as a whole via the TTC, but uh, but I think that probably even as we layer in um, you know some multilateral approaches, at least in the kind of near term, next one to two years, uh, bilateral is likely to remain a dominant feature in large part because there are really vast differences in the kind of regulatory regimes uh, of U.S. allies and partners here. I mean, you know, what, 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 I mean, we, we've heard from colleagues in the U.K. and Japan about what their countries have been doing, but even within Europe, you know, the difference between what France does and what, um, you know, Italy does and what Poland does are really quite large. And so you kind of need to have uh, bilateral discussions um, because just the difference in, you know, the authorities other countries have is really quite substantial. And, you know, until there is, we are working to try to develop some more unified standards, but until there is more of a unified standard across uh, a wider swath of countries around the world, I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, that's a very fair question. I think it's so a follow up for, for you and then also for Hugh. Um, you know, where does where do you think that the, has there been an involvement involved in how we've defined what is, you know, across cross border, what should be subject to screening and what should not be right. So where, you know, is there a growing you feel there's a growing consensus on um, on sensitive industries or are we actually diverging uh, more as we talk more about it? So I think that there is um, growing consensus in some areas, also divergence and potentially growing divergence in some areas, right? So I think that there is, for example, growing consensus among the U.S. and our key allies. You know, semiconductors are a key uh, key industry that we need to have a fairly similar um, approach to. I think there's growing consensus that, you know, artificial intelligence and advanced robotics uh, and autonomous vehicles, autonomous drones, you know, which is largely an AI, but also sensor driven uh, technology. And there is consensus on some of those um, technologies, not uniform, but I think there is consensus, um, you know, should be subject to review. So I think there are areas of growing consensus, but I also think there are areas of telecoms, obviously, I think, 
there is growing consensus. But there are also been interesting to see some areas of um, divergence. So I look at what's happening in the European Union, for example, right? The European Union has actually decided explicitly to consider non-national security factors in their investment screening regime. And in particular, they are now explicitly including uh, whether they're, they're implementing regulations that will explicitly include whether a foreign acquirer uh, it has um, distortive state subsidies uh, in their investment screening regime. Now, here in the U.S., by statute, CFIUS is a purely uh, national security-focused uh, uh, regime. I think there's sort of interesting questions we need to grapple with domestically. I think it's quite interesting what the European Union is doing here, of thinking about embracing distortive state subsidies as a basis for uh, investment review. It's something we don't currently do, but that's an area of divergence because the European Union is actually moving out ahead of, you know, for example, where we uh, or or most other uh, other governments are. I think it's sort of going you know, to be interesting to see us grapple uh, with that uh, shift over the you know next year or two. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Again, what's the line between a national security policy and a trade policy? Um, yeah, it's 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 really a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, Hugh or or or, uh, or Kazaki, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know we'd echo a lot of what Peter was saying there. And actually, when you look at the specific sorts of lists of technologies that we're interested in, and the the sectors that we've included in our mandatory notification process, there is a lot of commonality, I think, between us and our allies. And just as Peter was mentioning, some of those sectors, I was thinking about our own list. So things like advanced materials advanced robotics, AI, communications, semiconductors, you know, all of those sorts of things are on our list too. Um, we may define them slightly differently, but I think there's an awful lot of overlap there. Um, and we're doing quite a lot of work um, with our allies. We're doing quite a bit bilaterally, um, particularly with the US at the moment, but I think it's something we'll expand, looking at, you know, is our understanding of what sits below those sort of headline sectors the same? And do we set our sort of risk threshold in the same place or not? And if not, trying to understand why we don't do that. Um, I think the piece that is probably a bit more complex, and again, Peter, wrap around some of this. So when you get into things like market distorting practices and you know the, the very deliberate use of industrial strategy to undermine um, you know, an opponent's um, industrial base, Actually, that's an area where it comes a little bit more complex, and I don't think there's quite the same consensus yet as to how to respond to that. Okay, let me intervene a little bit. Uh, uh, the uh, sorry for uh, I'm back to the uh, panel, and uh, well, I agree that there are overlaps uh, among uh, allies on the like-minded countries regarding the important or critical sectors. Of course, uh, we do uh, protection policy by export control and investment screening, but at the same time, as Peter and who said that the uh, aspect of industrial policies are also uh, emerging. I think uh, there is uh, similarities among uh, allies or uh, uh, like-minded countries regarding the direction. Uh, it's a market-driven, targeted, uh, you know, support by uh, like-minded countries. At the same time, the uh, coordination of the export control uh, for uh, critical technologies and also uh, investment screening. Um, uh, actually, CFUS has a very strong uh, article, Article 69.4, uh, which allows us to have uh, information exchange and uh, cooperation with foreign enforcement authorities. So that is a very strong provision which mandates us to cooperate with like-minded countries and allies. So that is a natural consequence for us to compare notes or compare best practices or information with like-minded countries, uh, which may uh, close the gap regarding the uh, sensitivities uh, in the critical sectors. So that's my comment. Thank you. I, you know, thanks for the, the lively discussion here. We've had a couple of questions. United States, Japan, the UK. How do we think about emerging and disruptive technologies in the context of national security screening, um, foreign direct investment screening? 
the role of export controls for protecting um, emerging and disruptive technologies. We've mentioned AI a few times. We've mentioned quantum, um, um, other emerging technologies. So, uh, Peter, back over to you. Um, a question came in that that asked explicitly, could you expand a little on your last point on how to close the gap for investments in emerging technology startups, which may not meet the national security standards of CFIUS? Uh, what are your thoughts on being able to close that gap? Yeah, look, and I mean, we have an active, um, an active policy review process, and I don't want to get ahead of one example of some of the things, you know, we're doing, right? So, um, I gave my hypo uh, not hypothetical, I just can't get into the cases, um, but I gave not hypothetical, a real example where, you know, concerned about a transaction, an acquisition of a, of a uh, U.S. company um, that uh, was producing a sensitive but not universally export controlled um, uh, material and you know did not want to simply see the um, see the party's structure a sale of material rather than sale of company transaction you know, commerce has this authority where it can um, issue what's called an is informed letter uh, to a company which basically trolling it you can't export it uh, under these um, you know, particular circumstances, right? And so that's an authority that we have to close uh, a uh, particular uh, particular gap where, you know, we might not be prepared to say, you know, this we're ready to control this whole category of um, of, uh, of of materials or or um, uh, or technologies. I do think, you know, it is worth thinking through. Whether, you know, for certain, um, I, I do think it's worth thinking through whether, and, you know, and again, I think there's no administration policy on this. I think it is, you know, personally, I think it is worth thinking through whether for, you know, certain, um, it might be worth, you know, kind of flipping a presumption and sort of, uh, you know, having a presumption that acquisitions by strategic competitors of companies in these technologies, you know, would be presumed to have a national uh, security uh, risk uh, rather than the current sort of presumption that there's no risk and that you have to sort of prove to a reasonable degree of certainty that this particular transaction poses one. I think that's sort of a uh, an idea that is worth um, uh, worth uh, worth kicking around, and I think you know. Then there are other questions about um, you know, kind of as Congress looks at you know potential additional. Does anyone else want to jump in on EDTs? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's, it's undoubtedly been one of the most difficult areas for us, and we've spent quite a lot of time. Um, with our research labs and with the government chief scientists, you know, thinking about what do we know about emerging technologies? What do we know about the sorts of things we might be thinking about in terms of applications for them and the sorts of things that our adversaries might be thinking about? Um, I mean, the really difficult stuff comes with a very disruptive new technology, I think, where nobody really knows what the, the applications are going to be. And for us trying to work out what the sort of balance of risk and the theory of harm around that is is quite tough. I mean, we've had a few cases where we've done that, but we've tended to, when you get to those things, by definition, they tend to be unique bits of technology. But I think we, we recognise it's, it's a tough area. And I think it's probably one um, which we'd see as a bit of a priority for international collaboration, actually pooling our sort of understanding of technologies and how they might flow through to applications in the future. Yeah, let me jump in very briefly. In the, how can we catch up the uh, emerging technology? That is a critical issue for both export controls and uh, investment screenings. And uh, in the export control side, we are trying to do something like a uh, like-minded countries approach to create a new framework to address the uh, new technologies uh, quickly uh, as the uh, approach to do in a context of export control. But in a case of investment screenings, as we discussed, the, the, uh, how can we treat uh, such as venture uh, and venture capitals, uh, which capture the new technologies, but still the threat is very low. So in that case, uh, we are taking some balance uh, by having a certain you know, aspect of growth, but at the same time, risk, uh, like uh, 
data uh, related to the industry is uh, so cute. And then, well, we have uh, sometimes uh, face uh, difficulties to stop it. And then have uh, something like uh, mitigation measures. So those are the uh, usual practice. And also we publish finance and uh, uh, other ministries, including us, uh, the responsible for sectors, uh, which includes the, all the national security aspect and the data aspect and the leakage of technology. And uh, so by having this reference, uh, we address the uh, daily, uh, I would say, implementation. So by doing so, uh, I would say that uh, we can catch up the uh, challenge of emerging technologies. Okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, change, switch this a little bit up because um, we have several colleagues in the chat who are again talking about the balance between times of that. Um, but I have a question here from from Ben Josloff, actually, is a former colleague of mine and who uh, who oversaw the the firm of reform itself. And he's saying, well, with all the increased focus on FDI screening, how can governments ensure that beneficial investment isn't curtailed, right? How do we make sure that the pendulum doesn't swing too far? There's a, another question further down about the balance between FDI um, and prosperity. So um, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. This is sort of the, the key question here because I heard the term industrial strategy being punted around a little bit. So. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like some further thought on how... You know, it's a key thing that we've tried to look at as we've brought in this new legislation because it is a very dramatic change in how we do things. Um, and I think for us, there are a couple of things around this. I mean, we do remain very open to inward investment, even in the defence sector, actually. Quite a lot of our suppliers are foreign-owned. You know, I think our second largest supplier is actually Boeing. So, you know, we have a lot of foreign ownership in the, the defence supply chain. Um, but what we've what we've looked at um, very much, I think, is first of all the legislation, you know, will only capture quite a small percentage, even in terms of the mandatory notification sectors of uh, M and A transactions across the economy. And so we've been really keen to try and make it clear to investors exactly the sorts of things that we think will fall within the legislation, and the sorts of things will be outside to try and remove as much uncertainty as we can around that and then secondly because you know I think investors are wary about getting entangled in government process stuff about to publish a statement in parliament I think that will set out quite a lot of you know internally how we've handled these things so very much it's about reassuring investors that you know this will apply specifically to things that have a national security dimension you know it'll be a relatively small subset of MA transactions and we will have a transparent and as far as we can given the nature of the threat pre predictable process in how we respond to it so i think that's how we sort of try to balance those things anyone else a thought on that I just pick up actually on one of Hugh's um, points. I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind the extremely limited scale of transactions that CFIUS actually reviews and the, the number that, that, that actually get impacted here. I mean, um, no, it's not to say obviously there can be a broader chilling effect and all the rest, right? But CFIUS in the U.S., handles, you know, in recent years, you know, maybe 300, uh, 400 transactions a year. Now that's increasing because of FIRMA, but still you're talking about a minuscule percentage of foreign investment uh, in the U.S. that gets any kind of review at all. The vast majority of those cases uh, are cleared. Um, you know, the, 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 all, sometimes with mitigation, I mean, this is an important part of it is it's not sort of a binary we block or we allow. There is in most cases where there's some sort of risk identified, uh, many cases, there's not a risk in those cases where there is a risk, you know, the, the, the first reaction is often to mitigate that risk. Um, you know, so how do you make sure that as I say, maybe there's a consensual agreement known as a national security agreement to, you know, keep the sensitive IP in the U.S. or, you know, what have you. Um, you know, so the vast majority of that small number of cases are cleared potentially uh, with mitigation. And then there's a reason why the, you know, minuscule handful of cases that actually get blocked uh, tend to be in the news, because it is not a routine thing <laughs> to, uh, to actually 
important issue. It plays a vital role in our national security, but it actually only affects a tiny number of transactions uh, compared to the universe that's out there. Yeah, I briefly uh, echo the uh, Peter's point. Uh, the in our experience, uh, last uh, one year and a half after the free implementation, the enforcement of the new strengthened uh, foreign exchange and foreign trade law, the vast majority of cases, uh, of course, are cleared, and uh, we respect uh, you know sort of the uh, inward investment as a driving force for growth. So we are. Uh, you know, trying to be very much, uh, you know, transparent and uh, with uh, close consultations with the industries, of course, and uh, as well as uh, investors. And um, therefore, uh, that's a very much a sensitive area for the government as a whole to balance between, uh, of course, uh, national security and economic growth. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I, I um, appreciate how each of you have really delineated that although this is, you know, we've, we talk about this issue a lot, it's it sort of in, increased its uh, exposure in our daily parlance, we really are sticking to a technocratic process and one that has, um, has, has concrete bounds. Um, with, uh, with the recognition that it's getting late in Japan and the busyness of our colleagues, I'm going to close out here. Uh, thank you so much to Peter, to Kozeki Jun, and to Hugh for joining us um, and really enlightening us with the process that's going on in each of your respective quarters. Um, and of course, to Karen for this great partnership that we have. Um, and we'll see you all very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>